it's certainly a contagion factor driven by what's happening in the United States. It's a loss of faith in the system rather than an actual weakness. So the problems of Credit Suisse are very, very different to the problems that we saw with SVB in America and the other collapses that are taking place. Professor Powers, what is your take? I would agree with Daryl that, that the problems of Credit Suisse are, are, are quite different, but they also um, have been uh, on a longer term. That is, the, the, they've existed. People have known about these problems for a while. So it, it's different in a number, of, a number of ways. But when people become concerned about bank failures in one place, they look for weaknesses in others. And I think that explains some of the attention that, that is being turned to Credit Suisse and the banking industry as a whole. All right. Well, while people are scrambling to find solutions or, or, or measures are being made to inject confidence into the sector, let's take a look at uh, the underlying causes. Um, you know, the, the 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 context has been, from my observation or understanding, is that the Fed has been inundating the system with in central banks with cash, with uh, money, 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 and then there is this inflation that came up, which is. Uh, the highest in, in, in recent times on record. And then in order to curb that inflation, the Fed and central banks started to uh, hike interest rates in a very short period of time. And I understand that has led to the difficulty in some of the regional banks because the simple formula is when interest rates goes up, the yields on bonds go down and vice versa. So that is the situation that SVB has experienced. How do you, um, Daryl, again, how do you um, rate my assessment of the situation and how do you characterize the underlying issues that had led to SVB and signatures collapse? I think you've summarized that very well, but there are some additional factors. This, in part, is a consequence of the 2020 Fed decision to reduce bank reserve requirements from 10% to zero. Now, that means that banks are not required to keep any amount of their assets, in other words, your deposits, in cash or liquid equivalents to be able to service requested withdrawals. So this is one of the reasons why even a minor bank run has the potential to be a disaster. But they, for they any experienced the 2008 bank. financial crisis, they would understand. And, and from common sense, you would understand when, when you have no requirement for deposits, the, the risk for a bank run is very high. Are we, are we trying to put common sense and President Trump's actions in the same sentence? That seems a little contradictory. This was a reaction to the COVID breakout. People at the time warned that these would be some of the consequences. So we are seeing these chickens, as it were, coming home to roost. Now, we, to, to mix my metaphors, we can't say it's a canary in the coal mine. It's not quite that far. They are examples of a looseness in monetary policy, a change in interest rates policy, but these changes in reserve requirements have created a structural weakness within the system. Professor Powers, what is your assessment of uh, the, the the importance of the different factors that we just laid out, the excessive liquidity, the, the control of the rates by force in a very quick period, a very short period of time, and the uh, the taking away of uh, reserve ratio totally? I, I think that those are all very important components. I'm actually glad Daryl mentioned them because I, I would like to focus on, on something a little bit different. Uh, there's much discussion of the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank in this context as sort of the proximate cause to raising interest rates. I'd like to turn to the failure of the Federal Reserve Bank as a regulator of banks in the United States. It was the primary federal regulator of SVB. Now, there also was a California state regulator involved, but SVB had all sorts of red flags um, on its on its financial statements, it, it had grown in deposits very very rapidly, from about two uh, fifty billion in two thousand eighteen to over two hundred twenty billion in, in two thousand twenty two. This is a number one signal for financial services regulators. I'm a former insurance regulator. This is something that you you when there's a very very rapid growth, you keep a close eye on that particular firm. In addition, once you look at the firm. So you see that are you they saying have that the a, bank? Are you saying the bank did something irregular, or did the regulators do not? Absolutely. Look? Well, both. Both. The, the bank w w was was had placed itself in a very risky situation. It had a very a very high proportion of non retail depositors. That is, uh, retail depositors would be the ordinary people whose whose uh, who, whose whose deposits are are insured are largely covered by the by the federal um, guarantees. But it had tech startups with millions of dollars that were 
individually that we're, we're not going to be covered. So if there's any problem, these people are going to leave immediately. That's, that's part of what makes it a higher risk for a run in the bank. In addition, the bank was holding uh, very limited cash reserves, less than 50% of what banks typically were holding. And then finally, it had made a decision to invest a huge amount of its assets, the bank that is, more, uh, more, more than 50% of its assets in long-term risk-free bonds, um, which might seem fine at the time that they did it, but they locked themselves into it um, with this, this group of non-retail depositors so I'm... that if there are any kind of interest uh, rate, rise in interest rates, they were at extremely high risk of a problem. I understand. But when you have interest rates at uh, persistently low levels, even sub-zero levels, isn't it a uh, natural thing to do for some banks to, to seek higher yields and invest in these things, not foreseeing that the interest rate would go up so fast so quickly? You know, so much so quickly. Okay, first, first of all, it might be an ordinary or, or very reasonable thing for a layperson to to do that. Yes, but banks were not doing that. SVB is was out. It was something of an outlier in this case in terms of the, the amount of its assets that it had invested in in, in long term risk free bonds. So it clearly had um, indicated a number of red flags that should have been picked up by regulators. I can't, you know, the California regulators had the primary responsibility, but state regulatory agencies are often underfunded. Really, the Federal Reserve Bank should have noticed this is a very large bank that should have been paying attention. To. All right. Um, Daryl, do you think SVB is the only bank or one of the few banks that were doing this or potentially there are other cases that are just not known that had not you know blown up yet and uh how about other regulators in other states in the, of the united of the united states i think there are two aspects of this first of all yes certainly there are other banks that are going to come under increasing pressure as interest rates rise they will have made similar poor management decisions but we also need to remember that bank collapses are relatively common in the u.s particularly compared to other countries we all, the difference between now and 2008, what we're talking about is mismanagement of various types in an individual bank, whereas in 2008, it was driven primarily by a toxic derivative product, those collateralized see, debt yeah. obligations or CDOs. How do, you, how do you look at things going forward? I mean, for instance, uh, first of all, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation has decided to to back all uninsured customers, um, that some say is going to lead greater instability in the banking system. Do you think that is the case? This is one, Daryl. And secondly, there, there are people who are saying when, when rates are controlled in the market, a more problem is going to be exposed. First of all, we need to remember that federal deposit insurance does not fully apply to business accounts. It applies to personal accounts. And even then, where business is able to sneak around the regulations, the amount that's covered is pretty small, 250000 I think, from memory. So if you've got a, a $25 million loan from the bank or a, a relationship, that's not going to save you. That's the important fact to remember. So, yes, there will be increasing bank failures. What's important is how many banks come to the rescue of those bank failures so that the burden on the state coming to the rescue is reduced. At this stage, we don't see it being a repeat of 2008. Yes, there'll be nervousness. We're in a scary mo movie. Every movie, we're ready to nervous, we're ready to jump when something jumps out beside us. It exaggerates any type of problem that's already existing in a bank. And we saw that with Credit Suisse overnight, and that's going to work through uh, financial system in relation to banks in particular over the next few days. And um, Professor Powell, your take briefly? Uh, yes, I, I agree with what, what Daryl has said. It, um, in, in fact, if it were not for the fear for, that these depositors of SVB had, um, it, the bank might might have um, continued to 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 survive. Um, if if, for example, President Biden, you know, had had foresight or you know he could see the future and had made a statement a week before that all of these um, accounts would be covered regardless of whether they exceeded the the two hundred fifty thousand dollar limit or not, um, there would have been no need for the run on the bank and um, and it could have it could have persisted. So it, it's very different in that. Um, I, I think fear and, uh, you know, the, the, the run, the, the, the principle of a run on the bank, and uh, this could occur in other places, that is a much bigger component 
than what we saw in 2008, where there were really systemic problems with risk that was being ignored and you know not recognized by rating agencies, not well understood and not well insured. Finally, Daryl, um, the problem is still there. I mean, the Fed and central banks are still likely to continue to raise uh, interest rates because inflation is persistently high, and yet financial institutions are put into this situation. By the way, you know, the, the printing money to solve problem formula seems to have always is still in place. How do you look at the, um, the underlying dilemmas um, that are not addressed at this moment? One might call it um, US-style destructive capitalism in the sense that the rise in interest rates is going to strangle the weakest in that sector. And the hope is that provides merger and acquisition opportunities for other banks to buy out those weaker banks. What we have to be careful of is that those companies, particularly in the tech-heavy sector, who have been impacted by the SVB um, collapse, is that they will need to refinance. And that becomes more expensive as interest rates rise. That's going to have an impact on the trajectory and the momentum of tech development in the United States. And that's probably the most important outcome of what's happening at the moment, rather than a, a general weakness within the banking sector. OK, we have to leave at that time is up. Uh, many thanks to Daryl Guppy, financial market analyst, and Michael Powell's Zurich Insurance Group Chair Professor at Tsinghua University School of Economics and Management. <laughs> With that, we come to the end of this edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Liu Xin in Beijing. On behalf of the whole team, thanks for watching. You've got The Point and have a good weekend.